Mats was born back in 1989 as a very happy boy. Uh, he was our firstborn and we were very delighted over the fact that we had got a son. We had dreams for him. Uh, I was a football player myself when I was young, so my biggest dream was, of course, that uh, Mats should become a professional football player. So we had all the normal dreams uh, of Mats uh, when he was born as all the other uh, parents. So that's, that's the beginning of his history and of his life. When Mats was three years old, we saw that he chose different strategies in his playing with other children. He didn't want to climb ladders, he didn't want to climb in mountains, he didn't want to climb in trees, and that worried us. So we started to uh, ask uh, medical people expertise about what could uh, be the cause of this. Uh, and uh, the first year they looked upon us as being traditionally worried parents. But when he was four, he was diagnosed uh, with a muscle disease. We were explained that gradually he would lose the power of his muscles. And over a period of 20 years, he would gradually lose all of his abilities and he would not live to be a very old man. And that changed our lives, of course. At his funeral, uh, we namely had several people popping up in the church, which we had never met before people coming from all over Europe who had flown in to Oslo saying that they were close friends of Mats and asking if they could come to the ceremony here in Oslo when he was buried. And these were people I didn't know about. These were people I didn't know existed. Uh, but obviously they knew my son very well, even though my son never left the house because of his muscle disease the last 10 years of his life. And it came as a big surprise that he had so many close friends who he had been so important to and who had been so important to him and which I had never seen, even though I saw my son every day. Mats had not met any of them. He didn't want to meet them uh, because he was afraid that his handicap would have an impact on the relationship he had established online. He had namely, over a period of 15 to 20,000 hours of gaming, and it was primarily role-playing gaming that he was interacting with people from all over Europe. Through this period, he had connected with a group of people, 20 to 30 people, and 15 to 20,000 hours, that's approximately 10 years of work. So it's a huge amount of time that he had spent with his online friends and they had connected. And as one of his friends said in a speech at his funeral, when you spend so much time together online, you take away everything that has to do with age because you don't see age online. You take away the color of your skin because you don't see color of skin online. You take away your cultural background, you take away handicap, you take away all the things that pollute relationships when we meet physically. And over a long period of time to connect with people based on who you want to be, your ideas and your thinking is probably purer and stronger than what we experience when we meet physically. And I think, at least for my generation, this has been a surprise. Uh, Iblin was a big uh, man, he was a muscular man. Uh, he had a nickname, he was called the Fox, and he liked to run. Mats started to use a wheelchair because his legs became so weak at an age of eight, so he couldn't run and he wasn't strong. So when he, at the age of 14, developed Iblin, maybe it was a way of compensating what he couldn't do in the physical world was actually created in the digital world. But I've been thinking that as his physical life was deteriorating over a long period of time, his digital life 
became richer and richer. And I think the sole reason for his positivism was actually what he was engaged in and what he experienced in the online role-playing world. I knew that the gaming was important to Mats, uh, but I thought it primarily was entertainment. I thought that uh, it was okay-ish for him to spend so much time on gaming because he was physically disabled. Uh, so we were liberal. We accepted that he spent several hours every day in front of his computer gaming. But his sister, which was a half and a year uh, younger and had no muscle disease, she was not allowed by us to game so much because she had to go out there, do the real stuff, play handball, meet the real friends, as we call them. I joined her to the handball matches. I was sitting in the arenas to watch the game. I met the parents of the other players. I met the other players. But with Mats and his gaming world, I never joined him into the game. I never met the other avatars. I never met their parents. Uh, I didn't involve myself in the same way in that world. And I think that is one of the big mistakes that we as the parent generation are actually doing towards our young gamers. We don't view it as a real engagement in something new that this generation has in a way developed. And that is where I also made my mistakes. My son's first love affair, his first crush was online. He met with a girl from the Netherlands, which he actually became in love with. He never met her and that's a sorrow. But they exchanged gifts, they exchanged stories, they wrote a book together. They had deep, real feelings for each other. I didn't know this. I didn't know this until he had passed away and when all these people reached out and they shared the real stories with us. The idea when we agreed to share this story with NRK was that it would be interested to a small niche of people. Maybe those with children with handicaps, maybe those with uh, a special interest for gaming. That was a wrong assumption. I think now the story has been read by between 7 and 10 million people uh, around the world. Uh, it has been going viral both in Europe and in uh, America. Publishing companies are asking if it could, could be an idea to write a book about this story. Film creators have been asking if it could be an idea to create a film about this story. So what I think has happened here is that this story, it actually finds so many different dimensions that it actually addresses. What does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to live a valuable life? What does love mean? What kind of generation gap is actually identified here, which explains a little bit about why parents are so uh, frustrated around the gaming that the young people are spending so much time in and which is so important to them and so on and so forth. It's all these different dimensions that I think this story is opening up.